please welcome Alexander to the stage as well. Stuck with this thing. Hi, um, I am so keen and interested in what you guys have said, and I'm coming from a completely, hopefully, complementary perspective, but very, very different. Um, my background is in industrial design, which is very different. It's not the, um, in a way, the digital space, but it definitely is the physical space. And uh, my background is also in selling weird things to people. Um, one of those weird things is the Arduino. Who here has owned an Arduino in the past? Keep your hand up if you've ever made anything with it. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I was the first UK distributor of this platform. It's an electronics education platform. Uh, it came in before the Raspberry Pi, which you might be a little bit more familiar with. Small computers, open source hardware, open source software. For the last eight years, I've been running the London IoT meetup. Um, I don't know if York has an IoT meetup, does it? Ooh, an opportunity in the room. Um, and uh, it's a great community. It's now the second largest meetup in the world around this topic, which is amazing. Not a million people show up at the actual events, but we have a great newsletter. Um, <laughs> I also am the founder of a product called the Goodnight Lamp, which is a family of lamps for your global friends and family. You have a big lamp and little lamps. You give the little lamps away to anybody around the world, and when you turn the big lamp on, the little ones turn on. So if you have a family member in a different time zone, to let them know that now's a good time for a chat, you're available right now. Um, it's quite an ambient device. It uses uh, GSM technologies, so you just literally need to turn the light on and nothing else. Um, and I've just published a book on smart homes, which you can totally buy online now. But um, we're here to talk about freedom. Um, and I kind of, it got me thinking uh, a lot about the kind of work that I exist in, which is a work um, that is, you know, supposedly on some kind of bleeding edge of some kind of innovation landscape. And um, I kind of started thinking about how much freedom we have and how much freedom we actually want in the kind of work that we do. Um, so uh, a form of freedom in the kind of community that I'm in is architecture. You know, when you're an architect, you're kind of free to do a whole bunch of different things, but you also encounter um, quite a lot of problems. This is a building by Santiago Calatrava, who is absolutely not known for his good architectural work. He gets sued quite a lot for uh, buildings that have tiles that fall down, that has uh, surfaces that are too slippery, that has bits of bleachers in stadiums that fall down. It's really quite appalling, actually. Um, this is from Montreal. I'm, my family is in Montreal. And uh, in 2006, a bridge collapsed, which was a, bit, a bridge that was built in 1970 that was meant, meant to last 70 years. It lasted 36 years. And so even in the world of kind of um, engineering and structural engineering, um, there's a kind of limit to what freedom means. And maybe you don't want people necessarily to do whatever they want with the concrete mix in this particular case. Um, and we've seen that a lot more recently, of course, in Genoa and Italy, where, um, yeah, we kind of give people the freedom to design beautiful bridges, but then the maintenance piece is like whatever. And that relates really very much to the landscape around my field of practice, which is a world of connected products. So there's a physical product there, and then there's a digital experience there, and people are doing kind of whatever they want. Um, so this is uh, Revolve. Revolve was a smart hub, a smart home hub. Um, they sold to Nest, who then very quickly sold to Google, and they disconnected all their users from one day to the next. They were like, oh, sorry, no. We, we said our, you know, in our terms and conditions that you would get lifelong support, we didn't mean it, and you, know, you can't get a refund because we're shutting down everything. Uh, we have fridges that send spam. Um, this is not the fridge that sends spam, just in case someone from Samsung wants to sue me. Um, this is uh, James uh, Liang, who was the only engineer, um, or one of the first engineers, to actually go to jail for the Volkswagen emission scandal because it turns out that you can put engineers in jail, but you don't put upper management in jail, which is always super funny. Um, 
In the world of connected products as well, you would have seen kind of baby monitors that are hacked and uh, taken over because they're using Wi-Fi, which isn't the best use of that particular technology. Um, and Alexas that sort of record your stuff occasionally. So I exist in a landscape that is very risky, that is perceived in a really strange way by consumers as well, and so everyone's being rather uh, careful. And you start to think, well, is there too much freedom in that particular space? Can we just do anything we like and ship products to the consumers and just never live with the uh, repercussions necessarily? Um, but then, you know, what's the alternative? And the alternative is uh, an alternative that everybody always hates in the technology sector, uh, which is uh, standards, you know. Oh, oh, standards. And in the world of the Internet of Things, there's quite a few that are coming up. Um, trust marks and standards and things that you should be doing. Um, and you'll pay quite a lot of money to get that mark, but then it'll prove to the consumer that you're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, and, you know, not to take a kind of good old classic, but XKCD has the answer to everything under the sun. Um, and, you know, standards are useful and yet not, somehow. Um, and a really much ruder interpretation of that, just to continue with my really terrible theme of terrible jokes. Um, the idea that we have to regulate the space is very tricky because it does prevent people from necessarily going and developing something that could be quite interesting. And so we end up really at a place where we just start to think much more strategically and much more philosophically in the circles that I hang out in. Uh, who knows who this is? Brownie points. Excellent. Um, you win something. I'll, I'll figure out. You win a book. There. You win one of my books. Um, at me on Twitter. Um, this does not apply to people on the video. Uh, Dieter Rams was the designer of Braun products, uh, who were one of the inspirations for Apple products, amongst other things. And uh, he designed quite a suite of really beautiful hi-fis and really beautiful radios. Uh, but he also sat down and wrote the 10 principles of good design which are really quite useful still now, weirdly. Um, they were written in the 70s, and it still kind of applies, and he talks about ethics, and he talks about what in his world of disconnected products, uh, good design means. And I think that it still applies to the world now, and certainly applies to my uh, field of practice, because really good design starts to be something that you think of in terms of, well, okay, it's great to have ideas of what good design is. I want it to be actionable. I want to be able to know what to do. And I want to be able to know what to do at the right time. I work with a lot of startups. I myself, you know, I'm a small company. I have products that I make at very small scale. Um, I don't necessarily think that I can influence uh, someone who is making millions and millions of a particular device, but I think that I can help educate people who are just at the beginning of their journey making something that's connected. Um, and so why not? And so uh, for a year now, I've been working with a bunch of people in the community around something called the Open IoT Mark. And this is literally right now a checklist that you can go through and questions that we ask you as a small startup to ask you, hey, have you considered a bunch of things? Some of these things relate to access. So have you considered how a GDPR might apply to the product that you're making, for example? Um, are you allowing your customers to erase their history? Are you allowing your customers to access their information, get an archive, all those kinds of things, which you wouldn't necessarily think you should be doing with the physical world, but that's where we are now. Your connected toothbrush probably has a database somewhere of how often you brush your teeth. Uh, we talk about ownership, so when you gift something to someone that's connected, um, who registered it in the first place, can you allow for that ownership to shift because maybe you give that product to your niece or your nephew, you sell it on eBay. Um, that data and that ownership has to be flexible, has to be something that you allow for. Um, transparency, being able to make sure that your customers know what primary functionality you will always support and what secondary functionalities might change because you're pivoting or because you're doing whatever it is. 
um, firmware updates, backend updates, anything that relates to that product, you have to have a conversation with your customers, which, again, if you were in the business of making dumb things in the past, you didn't have to worry about. Or it was something that your wholesalers or your distributors had to worry about. Security, I'm sure this is something that comes up, uh, has come up for the last four days. Uh, security at every level. And it's kind of a checklist. You can literally go to some people's websites and go, I am doing these things with respects to firmware, hardware, chipset choices, etc. And uh, being clear about how much you support people. Uh, is it long-term support that you're offering? Is it short-term support? Just be clear. Just tell your customers, I'm going to support this for one year or I'm going to support this for six months. But don't kind of hide behind uh, consumer protection laws or data protection laws or anything like that. Um, and, you know, in a great world where everything's open source and everybody plays well with everyone, it would be great if you were interoperable um, and you allowed other people to use your own company's devices or your customer wants to change the back-end access to be provided by someone else with your physical product. It'd be great if you allowed that to happen. We don't quite live in that world yet, but these are things that we think small companies need to think about. They need to sort of... Uh, have at the back of their mind as a world that might come their way one day. And um, the end piece that we always talk about, and I think it's the most important, is this idea of future-proofing. So repairability and sustainability are topics in industrial design which are really old and no one ever does anything around. Um, my not smart uh, electric toothbrush just uh, broke and now I'm having to go through some website to figure out if I can replace the battery or not. If I have to check this thing, where do I check this thing? I feel really terrible because it's a lithium battery hidden inside some plastic thing that I can't open up myself. These are all terrible industrial design practices that have to do with the relationship to IP in the physical world, but that's changing. It kind of has to change with IoT. So I think that um, instead of talking about the restriction of freedom because we get people to design in different ways, we have to think of it as design freedom. People hate having no barriers whatsoever to design things in the design world. So you're kind of giving them a framework. You're giving them a brief. You're telling them like, okay, go nuts, but within these kinds of things and within these kinds of um, frameworks. And I think that that's better than you know, waiting for stuff to happen. I had a really scary conversation with a really good lawyer in Washington, D.C., who told me that uh, the government essentially does not care about IoT until a 14-year-old white girl dies because of a connected product. And so we can't operate in a world where that cliff is there as, oh, well, we'll start doing good design when shit happens. Um, let's not, you know, operate that way, and hopefully this is something that people around you can use and uh, make use of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and for me, a perfect mix of actionable stuff with this really philosophical outlook. So thank you for putting those two elements together. Thanks. Um, IoT is kind of an acronym that's been out there for several years now, probably at least five, and yet we're only really starting to see the emergence of, of standards right now. Is, is there an argument to say that any new technology or raft of technologies needs that grace period of, of complete freedom to make mistakes and explore things in order for the, the true purpose of that technology to be discovered? I, um, I mean, the, um, Kevin Ashton uh, coined the term IoT in 2001. Right. So it's been, it's, we've had a long grace period. Um, but I think that we allow ourselves to get excited by new technologies because they feel like that's what the future is supposed to be about. You know, the Jetsons and these images of the future, I think, entice us into just accepting stuff. And then something bad happens and we go, oh, but I can't believe this was allowed to happen. And that's true within a framework. So most plastic objects that you will buy will have a seal that says uh, if they're recycled or not. That's not a standard. That is an agreed behavior from all the plastic manufacturers in the world. They've agreed to identify the type of plastic that is used in that product because they know that 
along the line, further along the line, the uh, recycling companies really appreciate it because they know how to sort those plastics. Um, so there are mechanisms and there are, you know, there's FCC, there's UL, there's whatever. And those are proper marks that you will pay quite a lot of money for and really act as trade barriers as well. Okay. And so even within the craziness that we see, there's still quite a lot of barriers to innovation. Um, how much, you know, how much do we stop people from really doing stuff is that conversation that we have. It's the conversation of, well, shouldn't we just, you know, offer better education, offer better training, um, enable incubators to talk about these topics really early on instead of going, go, 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 it doesn't matter what you're doing, you've only got three months and ten grand. So that attitude, I think, and that education piece is missing. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, when we start to talk about kite marks and trust, um, to what extent is your audience and the people that you need to educate and reach manufacturers, and to what extent is it the public who are going to look for that kite mark ultimately? I mean, I think it's a combination of both. Uh, we oomed and ahmed about becoming a kite mark properly for a long time, and then we found, and I, I um, posted earlier on the IoT Mark Twitter account, the list of like 60 different efforts around the world to somehow formalize all of this. So I think that we're one in a series of different actors who are trying to not only educate, I'm less interested in big companies than I am in startups. I think it's really, really a shame when a super young company does something really dumb in security. And then people go, oh, never buy from them because you're kind of hurting a team of five people who don't earn a lot of money as opposed to, you know, however many tomatoes we can throw at uh, the big companies. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't shift them all that much. Yeah. Um, so I'm more interested in um, the impact we can have on startups because maybe the consumer never sees anything on their side, on the packaging. They might never see anything. But suddenly the quality rises, yep. you know, the quality of products rises, the quality of experiences rise, and then the larger company looks a bit shit, because right. then the, com the competition looks better. So that's what I'm more interested in. Okay, thank you. That's very future-facing. I know. <laughs> I've got one last question, but I'm just going to offer it to the panel in case anybody wants to jump in with anything. No. I oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I'm just very slow reacting. I love your light. I've seen that before. Oh, thanks. The home light. That's very good. Um, I think some of the products in this area, to me, are about uh, a corporate attempt of a plausible net future narrative, that they have very minimal functional benefit, and actually by introducing a level of complexity into what was previously similar, they actually just introduced a level of complication that's unneeded. But what it is vital for is providing those companies with a narrative that says we are the future. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, we could have a five-hour conversation about that. <laughs> uh, I think not only that, but they're pandering to a relationship to, especially the home space, because it's the space I know a lot about, they're pandering to a relationship to the home space that doesn't even exist anymore. So I don't want to control my lights because I'm at home like two hours a day really consciously because I just get up, I get out the door, and then I come home, I pass out because you know, I'm out doing stuff. And, or it's an Airbnb and it's, you know, you, we have a relationship yeah. to the home that's changed tons. It's very much like you said, the Jetsons, when it's the 1950s, this period of domestic mm -hmm. imagery, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like, oh yeah, we're going to put the robot and doing the washing up kind of vision. Yeah, yeah so it's a, it's a retro form of futurism. I'm astonished that they're doing it, to be honest. <laughs> but I, I mean, I speak, I'm going to speak now kind of from a cultural point of view rather yeah. than an engineering point of view. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. culturally, it makes no sense to me. The, uh, the best thing I saw recently was, um, and if you don't follow Internet of Shit on Twitter, <laughs> please do, it's a, it's a riot. Uh, but uh, the best thing I saw was someone who took a picture of the manual that they got um, in an Airbnb because they visited someone's Airbnb who had an Alexa, and they had a manual to tell them how to control the lights. Say this in this way, do not touch the physical plug. And if you want to turn you know, the other thing on, this is the language you have to use. And it's just insane. It's absolutely insane. 
And, and on insanity, um, that, that's an entirely inappropriate <laughs> word to finish on. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I didn't mean to say that at all. Um, uh, cover me, please, and put your hands together for Alexandra. Thank you.